This is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network. Um, I'm your host, Anila Cuellar, and today we have Nima Vedati, a conscious rapper coming in from Texas. Hi, Nima. Um, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, yeah, my name's Nima Vidati. I go by Nima V, I think, when I'm rapping, usually. Um, so I've been rapping for a while, but uh, my big hit was probably I Own Me. Uh, if you want to search that on YouTube, that sort of busted me out onto the scene. Um, and it was sort of an anthem for anarchy, right? I Own Me, self-ownership, nobody else can tell me what to do, um, the haters can all shut the hell up kind of a thing. And it was really out there, and, you know, I, I sort of staked my claim and uh, people dug it, you know. Free Talk Live called me up and wanted me to do an interview, and um, and I met uh, a guy named Michael W. Dean, who then we worked on a movie together called Guns and Weed: The Road to Freedom, where I've got a bunch of different songs, uh, wow. you know, music videos we did where I'm actually in there uh, rapping. And the concept was, you know, some people, a certain segment of society, they they think that the Second Amendment's really important, and they want to have their guns, and they can understand how it's ridiculous for the government to tell you what you can own as far as pieces of metal that help you defend yourself. And then there's another section of people that understand that you have the freedom to ingest whatever you want in your body. I mean, it's your body. Both sections of society understand personal freedom and self-ownership, so why can't they be on the same side, right? The, the battle isn't... Um, it shouldn't be left versus right. It shouldn't be gun people versus pot smokers. It should be all of us against those who would take away our freedoms, the state. And I think hip hop's a really great venue to sort of spit those out and go off on rants and tangents, but rhythmically to music so that people can feel it and get hype about it. Because I think that that's what kind of riles up people's emotions. Yeah, and music is definitely a great medium because people. Use it for entertainment purposes, but if you can slip a nice, uh, <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> right, right. you know, important message in there, you can uh, affect a lot of people's minds, and it just reaches so many people. You know, more right. than just say, you know, you write a book, and how many people are going to read an entire book, right? But <laughs> you say <laughs> you do a three, four right. minute song, and how many people are going to listen to that and, right, and get affected by it? So, yeah, it's definitely an awesome, an awesome medium. Um, so, so how would you say rap? Does it does it relate to voluntarism, or do you just see it as an instrument to to you you know to to spread the message? Well, I think rap completely relates to voluntarism. I, I don't think it initially started that way, but I think where people took it um, was an empowerment of themselves. And how it started was it was a subculture, right? It was um, people in an urban setting who didn't really have a whole lot of means to uh, to be out there in the mainstream. You know, it was an underground thing. And so people took what they had and they used it to create music. I mean, the first beats, they did, I mean, nowadays you go to Guitar Center and there's like these $1,200 machines that you can use to make beats, you know, and, and there's software and you can download things on Pirate Bay and you have $3,000 synthesizers that people use. But back then, people just took what they had. They took a record and a needle and another record and a needle and somebody built a mixer and they used it to create uh you know the first hip-hop beats and then a guy had a microphone and he didn't have classical training uh in singing or anything like that so he just spit he just spit his poetry mm -hmm. and he developed a rhythm to it and people got down with it and they started dancing to it and it, it really vibed with people and so i think it was a perfect expression of taking what you have and how you feel and putting it out there it's it's very self-empowering and i think when you think of voluntarism or anarchy that's the root of it man it's not about, oh, I don't want to follow the rules uh, or anything like that. It's, it's about, I'm, I'm an individual, right? To me, I'm the most important thing in the world, or maybe my family, uh, the people I love, but it's because I chose to love them. Um, it's not you. It's not Hillary Clinton. It's not Barack Obama. It's not George Bush. It's me and mine. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, that's what's most important, right? And I think, I think that hip-hop is, is about that, and, and so, so is what we do. So is liberty. You know, it's funny when you say um, me and, you know, um, it's about what I want, not about you. It's, I could imagine people looking at that and saying, wow, you're so selfish. You don't care about <laughs> other people, you know. <laughs> I can just imagine that. that's, the, that's the common uh, perception of, uh, you know, socialists or communists. You know, people think that we should all, you know, live together. We should share. We should, you know... Um, you know, you, you know, divide up the wealth and use, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. I, I think what they miss, though, is they miss that it's not selfish because I want the same for you. 
Yeah. You know, I want you to be able to do what you want, yeah. right? And I want them to be able to do what they want. I just afford them the same respect. That's all. It's it's more mutual than the communists or the anarcho syndicalists, because what they want is for you to to plan your life how they want it to be planned. That that's really what they want. Exactly. It's like in a in an in an anarcho anarcho capitalist society, you can have communists who want yeah. to live that way. However, in an anarcho or in just in a plain communist society, that's completely prohibited, right? You have a centralized authority that right. uh, determines uh, how everyone should live, the prices of all goods, you know, and where where things will be distributed, right? So it's completely planned. So it has no room whatever whatsoever for people who, you know, want to live free and want to, uh, you yeah, know, <laughs> keep keep the fruits of their labor. <laughs> yeah, and that's such that's such an important point to hammer home. It, there's a, a meme that I think sums it up really hilariously. It's like uh, the city's crumbling and there's these people marching, and it says the libertarians are taking over, so they can leave you alone. <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna say that. <laughs> yeah, that's a perfect way to say it. You know? that, that's what that's what would happen. We so so yeah, if, if you guys want to have your own redneck enclave where you only you know where you only teach evolution then that's fine as long as everybody's there voluntarily that's that's the key and that's why you you use the word voluntarism and i think that's really important to to throw that at people that hey man you can do whatever you want yeah. but you let me do whatever i want too and, and where the only conflicts are where my freedoms infringe on yours and then we work it out yeah and and then when somebody would tell you, like, you know, that's selfish, you know, we should all share, we should all, you know, distribute the wealth, then you have to ask somebody like that, well, what are you going to do if somebody doesn't want to do that? Mm. <laughs> are you really going to beat them up, you know, hurt them and imprison them? Are you really going to kill them? How far are you willing to go right. to achieve your ends, right? Right, and uh, because behind all those uh, flowery images is violence. Yeah, and they they never have a good answer to that, do they? Yeah, <laughs> they they always come up with, well, it'd be so great, nobody would want to <laughs> to deviate. Exactly right. <laughs> or you can move, you can move to another country. Ah, you know? I hate that. Yeah, yeah. If you don't, if you don't like it, get out. Go get move out. to Somalia. Exactly. If you don't like, or if you don't like to pay taxes, don't own property. You know, if you, if, you, uh, <laughs> uh-huh. if you don't like, you know, whatever. Just, just avoid it. Well, like, how can you avoid it when you know, you know, we, the United States has the most laws of any country in the world. The, you know, yeah. the the the, uh, the most, you know, the the largest tax code of any country. The most people in prison of any country, right? So, right, right, right. <laughs> it's getting a bit difficult to uh, just ignore it. You know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it really is, and I wonder, I really wonder how much longer people are going to put up with it, and I, I really think it's a matter of time, you know, I, um, I was doing a radio show every weekend called The Freedom Fiends, and I took a step back because I had a little girl, and I thought, you know, right now the most important thing is helping to raise her, and a, a person who's really involved with the show got back to me, and he said, you know, we're going to win this war no matter what. So it's okay. Don't feel bad. Don't feel like you're letting the movement down. And he's right. It's just a matter of time before people realize that, hey, consent is important. Why don't we universalize that? People, people understand now that rape is bad. They understand now that slavery is bad. Eventually, everybody, it'll be the moral consensus that the state is bad. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like, uh, you know, people get confused. You know, they understand, okay, one person shouldn't assault another person one put sh- one person shouldn't rape or steal from another person but if you have a large group doing it mm. <laughs> then it changes morality right all of a sudden you know you you uh you know you hide and obfuscate all of the uh you know the evil inside a, a complex bureaucracy mm-hmm. then all of a sudden that changes the laws of morality and makes it okay it makes right. theft right into something magical called taxation right <laughs> right right and i i feel like the the dumber of those people, they don't they don't get that there's a real distinction there. They're like, well, yeah, the cops are the good guys, and, and that's how it should be. But I think the more, the sophists of the bunch, the, the people who will try to talk you into that kind of stuff, yeah. they'll say things like, well, it's important. We need to have, we need to have standardization of justice. Mm-hmm. And I was in a Twitter battle with some, I guess, conservatives the other day, yeah. and one of them said, you know, just think of it as a collective gun. Think of the state as a collective gun. Yeah. And he meant it as a good thing. I, but really? I see it, oh, yeah, I, I see it the same way, but I see it as a bad thing. And it, his, his point was that we can all share the gun and we can use it to, <laughs> to defend ourselves from, I don't know what. Share I guess. the gun. Oh, my God. That's, that's so horrible. <laughs> yeah. And, and I don't know. 
I think I think there's some racism involved in stuff like that, or at least xenophobia. Uh, I mean, maybe maybe it's not racism against black people or Hispanic people. Maybe it's those others, because a lot of people like that are like, well, borders are important. Yeah, we want to yeah. want to use the collective gun to protect the borders, yeah, and it's yeah, like, yeah. well, maybe we should stop thinking of each other in in terms of borders and in collective groups. Exactly, exactly. You know, it's like. Uh, a person wants to move from one place to another. Why does it have to be called, you know, immigration or right. emigration? Right? It's just moving. Right? It's like it's just you, moving. You move. You move to another town. You know, <laughs> it's not a big deal. But you move from, you know, if you're on the border of the United States and you move into you know, a couple of miles into Mexico right. or the other way around, it's all of a sudden a big deal, and you need enormous paperwork. And you know, and and, and you know, even worse, you have to fly out of the country. How much? Uh, right. How much harassment do you have to put up with that? You know, I'm kinda... Exactly, exactly. I'm uh, I'm gonna go to an an Arcapulco, Jeff Berwick's thing. I think oh, you nice. first saw, saw me on on Anarchast. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm actually gonna be uh, performing, doing some songs there. Oh, nice. And nice. Um, Acapulco, if I were to fly straight from where I live, is like four hours, right? Okay. So if if Acapulco was didn't have an imaginary border on it, it would take me four hours to travel. It'd be really easy and cheap. Yeah. But I don't know what it is. I haven't looked into it, but it's got to be something to do with the state, right? There are very few nonstop flights, and most of the flights connect in Mexico City. Mm -hmm. And literally, the layover is so long that some of the flights, like <laughs> the total travel time, is eighteen hours. <laughs> what? Eighteen hours. <laughs> Just a, you mean what would be a four hours nonstop right. flight, right? Wow, right, That's right, amazing. Right. So it's it's yeah. it's like it's like if I were flying from Austin to Salt Lake City, why would it take me eighteen hours? Exactly. Government is the only <laughs> answer to that question. The, you know, uh, the only mo the only way that you can uh, effectively waste money and waste people's time and have people believe that it's for the common good and that it's necessary, <laughs> and right. without it, we would be you know mayhem, violence, and chaos. And uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, so that's that's cool though. You're gonna be an anarcho pulco, and w when is that gonna be? Uh, I think it's February 27th of next year. Oh, very nice. Yeah, yeah. Cool. So yeah. it's that whole weekend, I guess. So, so you're going to be, you, you have uh, songs that you know you're going to you're gonna do, or are you? <laughs> yeah, I mean, stuff? well, I, I haven't put the set list together yet, but I mean, I've got dozens of songs, so I'll just have to pick pick the best. And I'm, uh, I'm putting a lot of them up on YouTube. A lot of them I would sort of held on and not released because I was planning on putting together a full and proper album, but... Yeah. It's been like a year and a half, and so I said, "F it, I'm just gonna dump them, <laughs> gonna dump them all on YouTube over the next couple of weeks." Yeah, so. I, I assume that that gun video required a lot of editing and videotape, right? And uh, yeah, a lot of, a lot yeah. of work. it looked like a lot of work went into that. Yeah, yeah. Vi video videos are a lot of work. Uh, I'm still gonna do at least one more video, I think, before an Ar Arcapulco. Uh, I'm working with another ANCAP rapper named uh, Mason Moore. He's already sent me his verse, and it's it's amazing. Cool. So uh, we're coming out with that. Um, it's called See My Chains. It's going to be nice. <laughs> about the, the chains we still have on, right? The, the slavery of the state. So it's going to be like a duo, you and him rapping? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, he's got a verse, uh, you know, one out of three of the verses is him. Oh, yeah. And then I'm going to try to get him to, you know, jump in and do some overdubs for the, for the chorus, too. Mm -hmm. All right. Awesome. Wow. See, I wish my brother was here. You can ask you some more technical questions about, <laughs> about rapping, but... <laughs> But that's really awesome. I mean, you're uh, you're connecting with other uh, anarchist rappers. I'm sure it's a it's a small selection you have. Not not many, t right? Yeah, yeah. But it's getting more and more. I mean, four years ago, five years ago, when I first started doing this kind of hip hop, yeah, I couldn't find anybody else. There's very few. I mean, yeah. now there's. There's a couple, at least, you know. Uh, I mean, Rob Hustle's video is is, is huge now, yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's good to see people coming up and and using the same ideas and putting their own flavor on them. And I was amazed that Rob Hustle didn't identify himself as an anarchist. <laughs> you know, when right. he was asked the question, like, yeah. what? How could you not? That video is like, like so uh, blatantly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, the way Jeff told me is Jeff said, hey, you know, Jeff said he called him yeah. and Rob Hustle said, yeah, I've read Rothbard and I yeah, believe yeah. in the non-aggression principle. Yeah, that he must be, yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> that's, that's all, it, well, that's not all it takes. Maybe, but. maybe he was, maybe he was still in that lingering, you know, minarchist, I don't know, phase, you know, that people, you know, the six month phase that people get right. trapped in. <laughs> Some people it's a little bit longer, unfortunately, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So some people cling to the security blankets that they have that yeah. are important to them as far as the state. Yeah. Um, so, so tell me about your, your family. Like, um, 
do you, do they embrace what you're you know oh, rapping yeah. about or, and and your beliefs and you know government and things like that? Oh yeah, it's actually. Uh, I think that's one of the things I'm most proud of is is my family and how how intellectually honest they are. At least my immediate family, my brothers, my sisters, my parents. Really? My wife. So they, that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, pretty much all of them are anarchists. So they live. They live around you. Uh, well, actually, here in Austin, it's it's just me, my wife, my little girl, and my brother-in-law. Okay. Uh, and then all of my wife's extended family lives here in Austin. But my mom's in Houston. Okay. Uh, my dad and his whole side of the family are in Salt Lake. But um, my little brother Frank, he's a he's an activist for uh, Peaceful Streets Houston. It's kind of like Cop Block. Oh. He's a big big nice. fan of Cop Block. He wow. goes out and does the Cop Block thing. Nice. Um, He's done. He's, he's done podcasts before and been on shows, and uh, he totally gets it, man. He's a complete and cap voluntarist, all all that, the whole nine yards, and he actually raps really well too. He's he's been on. I don't know if I've ever released a song with him on it, but I've got one on the hard drive. Maybe I'll, I'll put it out there. Um, cool. He freestyles too. Uh, we we both grew up in Houston, and that's kind of a thing you learn when you're in high school. Is if you run in certain crowds, you know, you all kind of sit in a circle and freestyle yeah. which you know you just impromptu rapping so yeah. uh and he's he's gotten really good at it and um my other little brother who also lives in houston knight he's really into it too uh and he raps now too and then i've got a oh, brother nice. in Rapping salt family, lakes yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> i've got a brother in salt lake who's um who's really really smart and he's into austrian economics and he's actually read misses like the whole thing wow uh like human action at least he quotes it like he's read the whole thing or uh, he's got the cliff notes or something uh, um <laughs> and he's he's read anatomy of the state he's he's totally on top of it and so it sounds like it sounds like um like liber uh, and i guess voluntarism and anarcho-capitalism runs in your family right you you, you have yeah. exposure to it that is that basically what got you interested in it? well sort of i mean i'm the oldest i'm i'm the one who sort of put uh the label on it okay. but um my mom's always been an alternative thinker, and she taught me when I was really young that uh, voicing your opinion uh, is really important, and being an individual and being true to yourself is really important. And she's uh, to credit for me coming across the ideas of liberty because, like in the Jeff Berwick uh, Anarchist episode, I said she brought me to Ron Paul. You know, Ron mm. Paul had had come to her classroom and given a class on the the Constitution. You know. Really? Which, I'm, I'm a little involved beyond that now, yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but at the time I was a I guess a bad Democrat. Like yeah. I thought I thought the Democrats are the opposing party; they're the ones who I have to support. And then, blam! She showed me Ron Paul, and yeah. I read uh, I think it was a Foreign Policy of Freedom, uh -huh. and it just smacked me in the face. And I was like, <laughs> okay, this guy knows what he's talking about. <laughs> nice, yeah, yeah. I think with me, um, Ron Paul. Like the last time I voted was um, 2008. Obama, this is the first time, right? <laughs> Me too. Me too. And, yeah, and uh, I wrote, I wrote in Ron Paul. Ron, oh, you did Ron Paul? No, I, I voted I, Obama. I wrote it in. Oh, you you voted Obama? I vote Obama. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I, okay. I, I know, right? But that's the last time I voted, and um, and the only reason I did vote, I mean, I mean, I never really cared about politics at all because I never thought that it um, had any bearing on my life. But the only reason I voted was because my family, who are hardcore Democrats, <laughs> mm -hmm. said, this is what you have to do. You got to vote. Go out and there and vote. And so, you know, vote Democrat. So I basically did it because of that reason. But now, um, I'm, you know, the more I uh, read, you know, Anatomy of the State and uh, read Creature from Jekyll Island and, you know, the mm -hmm. um, what, what has government done to our money and all this, yeah. all this, all this awesome stuff, I'm rethinking all of it and um, realizing that... Uh, Voting is uh, quite dan or quite damaging and yeah. violent in and of itself. You know the yeah. the idea that you know you have your your opinion, you know, and you're trying to impose it on everyone else mm -hmm. through a politician, right? <laughs> right, right. But, but you know, so in that sense, it's very powerful. But then in another sense, you're you're impotent. You have no power because once a politician goes into office, he can do whatever he wants completely unaccountably. Right. And so, <laughs> well, and the way I look at it, too, is you're legitimizing the system, right? Yeah. I mean, if nobody showed up one day to vote, then it'd be a lot harder for them to claim consent to the governed. I mean, even now, 
Congress's approval rating is what in the single digits? Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> Presidential <laughs> approval rating is probably thirty, forty yeah, percent. Some yeah. some lower lower number. Um, and even when people do vote, it's the vast majority of people who still aren't voting. Like if you counted every human being in the American borders, mm -hmm. most of us don't vote, right? right? I mean, it's it's forty to thirty percent of people who are uh, registered who then go out and vote. So yeah. really. The non-voters win every election. <laughs> you, you just you just have a politician coming up and taking the credit for it. And I wonder how many how much percentage of those people who vote are you know the the the, the kids who vote because their mothers told them to, right. <laughs> not because you know, it's in it's in their heart to do it, right? Right, or the, not just their mothers, but Puff Daddy. You know, yeah. Oh, yeah. TV will tell them to yeah. vote or die, and and exactly. and their public schools and and the whole nine yards. Yeah, and um, you know, pop culture, I think, is is where volunteerism needs to make as many inroads as it can, because mm -hmm. I think we're at the point in society where. Um, People get, and I think kids get especially, that most of what they hear in school is BS. And most of what they hear from, say, authority figures is BS. It's just that the media that they're going to still glorifies police as the hero or the military as the hero. Um, and so, it, it, except in hip-hop still. I think hip-hop is an important thing culturally because generally in hip-hop the cops are the bad guy and generally it's okay uh to get out there and make your money despite what the law tells you to do mm -hmm. yeah exactly yeah hip-hop se seems like it's um inherently subversive in nature yeah right it's yeah. like <laughs> it's just naturally i mean yeah I'm, I'm actually talking about it like that i'm surprised more anarchists are not you know uh, or, or let's say more rappers are not anarchists you know and it right kind of right well me. <laughs> it, it, it's it's about giving them the the language and the title for what it is because I, I bet a lot of them are mm -hmm. they just don't know it yet and that's kind of this conversation me and Jeff had is mm -hmm. I mean or they or they don't want to come out you know or they don't want to come maybe out they're afraid afraid to come out maybe yeah. maybe they're afraid yeah maybe their record label tells them it's not a smart move yeah like uh, know. you know like um, Tupac right or uh, some, or some, yeah some, or. Some, or Lupe Fiasco. I mean, Lupe Fiasco was on Bill O'Reilly, and he called Barack Obama a terrorist to Bill O'Reilly's face, wow. like on national TV. You know, <laughs> yeah. doesn't get much better than that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you gotta have, you gotta have balls for that. But let me ask you. Um, so about your child, um, how do you envision like the future for your child? Like, um, I guess regarding schooling, ah. I, I assume. Like, what, what have you? Uh, what are you planning for that? Oh man, we we want to <laughs> we want to keep her out of public schools. Mm -hmm. um, that's the main goal. Everything else, I think, is a means to that. You know, the goal is to 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 educate her ourselves, uh, or at least be the ones in charge of her education. Mm -hmm. I think what public school ends up being is people delegate that whole child re rearing. Uh, sphere to the state mm -hmm. and I think that that's what's really dangerous is then kids pretty much become wards of the state and they, they end up spending what eight hours a day there and then they have to do homework when they come home and so the majority of the time they're learning from what the state wants them to think not from what not from what we want them to think exactly. and so I mean my daughter's only seven months, so obviously we don't have a curriculum yet or yeah, everything yeah. planned out. Yeah. But um, already, my wife, uh, she's planning on homeschooling. She's going to homeschooling meetings, so she's nice. starting to network a little bit with nice, people nice. in town. Yeah. And Austin's kind of a crunchy town, you know, it's kind of hippy dippy. There are a lot of <laughs> a lot of people out here who do homeschool already, and okay. and it's not really frowned upon. There's not a stigma for doing things differently uh, here in Central Texas. It's kind yeah. of accepted so cool. that's totally what we plan on doing so um like like with me um like me and my wife we do share you know some of these views but of course i'm more uh passionate about it you know i'm the one who in introduced her to all this volunteerism and right. anarcho-capitalism stuff so i'm like you're the, one, you're the one with the show right i'm like teaching her yeah i'm the one who's yeah. teaching her basically yeah. and you know i read all these books and i just tell her what i learned so so um and also i i i, I um i'm very influenced by Seth Molyneux. Uh, yeah, I'm sure you watch some of the videos. He's he's awesome, and and so I'm I'm pretty, I'm pretty open and free like regarding education. You know, I really don't think that kids require any sort of curriculum whatsoever. You know, my 
you know, everybody tells me, I still, I still get, you know, when I tell people, my family, I tell them, like, I'm going to, you know, homeschool. And they're like, well, how are they going to learn how to read? How are they going to learn their math, their history? How are they going to learn this? Blah, 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 blah. Right? So, I mean, my first answer is, how did you learn how to speak? Right? Nobody right. taught you how to speak. Right? right. We all learn yeah. how to speak. Um, basically by being around people who speak, right? Yeah, so, yeah. So, you know, you grow up and everybody has a personality and, and, and inclinations and desires. So you're going to gravitate to, you know, what you enjoy doing and perhaps you'll be an expert at it, right? And make a business out of it later. Like, right. you know, you want to be a good mechanic, you're going to hang out with mechanics, right? You want to be a good painter, you hang out with painters, <laughs> right? Yeah. So I think education is very simple, the way I look at it. And do you, what do you think? Yeah, I think you're completely right. And I, I think the other model that we have, what we're choosing against, really, is an education system that doesn't teach kids specialization at all. It tries to teach them and paint with broad brush strokes, and it compartmentalizes everything. So the kid spends only an hour doing one thing, and then he goes to the next class and spends only an hour doing math, and then only an hour doing science, and they don't really connect them together, and they don't get a chance to explore one thing that they're passionate about and fall in love with it. And um, was it is it Michael Gladwell, the author who wrote the book um, um, Outliers, about how you need 10,000 hours or something to be a genius at something? Anybody can be a genius. Yeah, you just yeah. need to practice it for 10,000 hours. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but instead, what our kids do is they, they have 10,000 hours of brainwashing by the time they're, <laughs> yeah. they're 18, of, of, of nonsense, of trying to get out and play, and, and play the system. You know, yeah. um, When I was in high school, uh, I, was, I was in the top 10 people, you know, of, of grade point averages, you know, and I was, I, I, I did really well, and a lot of the people around me, um, they made it sort of a game of, of cheating and, and, and getting ahead and, yeah. and, and gaming the system and, <laughs> and becoming friends with the teachers, and, and all they really learned was how to, um, how to make themselves ranked higher in a bureaucracy, you yeah. know, uh, and, and so a lot of them went on to do good things, and, and I'm not trying to denigrate them. I'm just saying that uh, I don't think a bureaucratic top-down system is the way you teach kids to be successful. And I don't plan on doing that with, with my little girl either. Of course not. And, and, and another thing, I, I saw a quote by Osho. Uh, he's like an Eastern uh, philosopher. Have you heard of Osho? He's a pretty cool no. guy. Uh, yeah, he's, um, yeah, my wife got me into him. It's like he talks a lot about Taoism and... Um, oh, okay. Kind of I think I... How do you, how do you spell it? Osho. I think I know him. O-S-H-O. Oh, no, I don't know him. Osho, yeah. So, so he... he um, there was a quote by him. He basically said that when you put your kids into public school... What you're essentially saying is that the information that I learned, you know, 20, 30 years ago, you need to learn because the world hasn't changed since then. Mm -hmm. And it's exactly the same <laughs> mm -hmm. as it is, you know, as it was then, as it is today. So you have to learn exactly the same things that I learned. <laughs> right. And it, right. it's such a sad thing that, you know, um, and, and also the other, the other way I describe um, public school is like the broken window fallacy, which is basically like, um, you know, people look at me and they say, well, well, look at you. You went to public school and you turned out okay. <laughs> <laughs> to which the answer would be, you know, okay, you see how I am now, but right. perhaps if I was allowed to pursue the things that I really wanted to pursue, you know, what could have I, what, what could I have achieved? <laughs> right. Exactly. It's right. the opportunity cost. It's yeah, the, it's exactly. the, it's the exactly. unseen, exactly. right? Yeah, the unseen. People, people yeah. don't get that. Yeah. Uh, and I felt like I've spent way too long after graduating college even because I feel like college is just an extension of public school and it prolongs you finding out what the real world is like. Yeah. And I felt, I felt like after graduating college, I spent a lot of time just trying to deprogram myself and learn how the world really works. And yeah. <laughs> that was wasted time too, you know? And I feel yeah. like I'm still, every day, I have to remind myself that I have to decide the next thing that I'm supposed to do, mm -hmm. and I have to make my plan. And I'm, it's like sometimes I feel like I'm just waiting for my next assignment, but that's not what I should be doing, right? I should be discovering exactly. my next opportunity, yeah. not waiting for my next assignment. Yeah, excellent. Well put. Well... We should end right there, getting up to the half hour. Um, so thank you very much, Nima, for the uh, opportunity to have a chat. Um, this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network. Uh, wishing all of you have a wonderful day. Take all right, care. thank you.
拜。